So uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for giving me a chance to give a talk at my home university where I did my undergrad. So today I'm going to be talking about wires. And as you can guess from the title, I'm going to try to be as non-serious as possible. So it's going to be, I, hopefully it's going to be really fun and very, very easy. So if there's any, any question that pops into your mind, please feel free to ask me. So as you can guess from this uh, big picture above, today we are going to be talking about these, these things called wiring diagrams. So why are wiring diagrams interesting? Because in algebraic combinatorics, and a lot of combinatorialists related, working with stuff related to representation theory, permutations, metric groups, this is a very commonly used object. <coughs> And recently, for people that work in completely different side of combinatorics, like people that work in probabilistic combinatorics, has also been doing a lot of research on wiring diagrams. For example, if you look at all wiring diagrams encoding a certain permutation, and you cut it at the middle, which still nets you with several wiring diagrams, then what is the distribution of the possible permutations you can get? Those are in my opinion, really interesting. And hopefully, uh, a lot of people working in other different fields might start using these objects. So what I'm going to be doing today is show you some very nice, simple, but new combinatorial property I found about those wiring diagrams. And what's more interesting is not the result itself, I mean, the result itself is okay, but not just the result itself, but the main theorem that lies behind that result, which is, I think, very textbook worthy. It's very nice to know. So I hope you enjoy it. So let's start out with the definition of a wiring diagram. So wiring diagram is just an arrangement of wires. Now, what is a wire? Well, wire, also called pseudo lines in a much more fancier manner. Pseudo lines are defined as the following. First, as you can see from the picture above, they connect some element on the left to some element on the right. For example, if I start, if I look at this wire, it connects one to four. And Looking at this wiring diagram gives me a permutation in the sense that we are looking at the permutation that sends 1 to 4, 2 to 3, 3 to 2, and 4 to 1. So wire is just a pseudo line connecting i to pi i, where pi is the corresponding permutation. And as you can see from the picture, this is not just some arbitrary jumble of lines. We have some topological conditions that we have to obey. The first one is if you look at those crossings, it's just the crossing of two lines at a time. So no three lines can cross at a point. Something like this is not allowed. This is bad. And another topological condition that has to be satisfied is that if you pick two, an arbitrary pair of wires, for example, if I choose the wire starting at 1 and the wire starting at 3, then they only cross once over here. The wire starts at 1 goes like this. The wire starts at 3 goes like this. And they only cross over here. So overall, there should not be a case where something like this happens. This is also not a lot. So all wiring diagrams that satisfy these three conditions are called the wiring diagrams of the permutation pi. So that was the basic definition of wiring diagrams. Now, they require the crossings to happen at the same time. 
Right. The define wiring diagram. Right. Of the permutation. Mm -hmm. How would you distinguish? I mean, so the third and the fourth crossing. What if you switch? Oh, these two. You so two. it is still a. Uh, it's still a wiring diagram, but yeah. you're saying the set. I the would say that they are different. Uh -huh. It's not really. The, the result I'm going to show doesn't really depend on that. And actually, a lot of combinatorics related to wiring diagrams don't depend on that ordering. But for our purposes, just to make it clear, thank you for pointing it out, I'm going to say that the order actually matters. And the main reason is here. So many of you might know that these look really familiar. So if you translate each of the crossings at the ith level into something called simple transpositions, then this just becomes the reduced word of a permutation. So what does that mean? Each si is something called the ith simple transposition. What they do is, given a permutation, such as like 1, 2, 3, 4. If I apply S2, then what I do is I'm going to be switching the second and third element. So if I apply S2 to this permutation, what I end up with is the permutation 1, 3, 2, 4. So all the SIs are defined this, this way. So given a, what a simple transposition SI does is you're switching the element, you're switching the ith and i plus first element of the permutation. So we can express each of those crossings in terms of these simple transpositions and it's fairly easy to read them out. This one corresponds to S1. This one corresponds to S2. This one corresponds to S3. Oh, no, S1. <laughs> yeah, this is some really hard combinatorics, right? So S1, and then S3, S2, and S1. So wiring diagrams represent this something called uh, reduced words of a permutation. And these simple transposition actually generate the group of permutations with respect to the following three relations, which you might have already learned in modern algebra one. So SIs generate the symmetric group Sn with respect to the following three relationships. The first one is if you apply a simple transposition twice, it shouldn't really do anything, which seems obvious, right? If you switch two elements that are adjacent and then switch again, then you're basically back to where you started, right? So Si squared equals the identity. And a slightly less trivial relationship is that if you have two simple transpositions that are not adjacent, that is i and j are not adjacent, then they actually commute. Because if you think about a permutation that has like uh, six letters, if you switch the first and second guy, and if you switch the fifth and sixth guy, the order of those operations don't really matter, right? So this basically says that the simple transpositions that are far away don't really interact with each other. They just commute. And the third one, which is the hardest one, is something called the braid relation. <coughs> so basically, if you switch at the i position, and then at the i plus month position, and then the i position, the thing you end up with is basically same as switching at i plus first, i, and then i plus first. 
So this is called the braid relationship. I hope this uh, board doesn't break down today. <laughs> I don't have to pay for that, right? So we have these relationship. And we have a mutation operation on those wiring diagrams basically coming from these two relationships. So you can sort of guess how they're going to be, right? What would, this, what would the mutation corresponding to this relationship be? It's basically, given a wiring diagram, you can switch the order of these two guys, and you're still going to end up with the wiring diagram that encodes the same permutation. So if I switch these two guys, the permutation that is encoded does not change. And this one actually gives a more interesting operation. Given a wiring diagram that has some parts looking like this, so SI, SI, SI plus one, and then SI, I can mutate this into the following picture. So, so this corresponds to I, I plus one, I plus two. So SI, SI plus one, SI, you can mutate it with SI plus one, SI and SI plus one. So, I mean, it has been a really long basic introduction, but basically what you have to remember is that given a series of these wiring diagrams, there you can apply these mutation operations on these wiring diagrams and still end up with the same permutation. That's what you should remember. Okay, so we have these mutations. And a really nice fact is, well, I'm just going to use the board over there. A nice fact to know is the following. So starting from a wiring diagram, given a wiring diagram of pi, applying these operations, do not change pi, which is kind of obvious. The second fact, which seems very natural, but actually slightly non-trivial to prove, is that given two wiring diagrams of the same permutation, Given two wiring diagrams of the same permutation, you can actually mutate one to another using a sequence of such mutations. So basically, for us algebraic of uh, I guess combinatorialists in general, if you have some sort of a mutation structure, then what you should always try to do is look at the mutation graph. You have the vertices correspond to states, <coughs> and mutations correspond to edges between the vertices, and you want to sort of study the structure of that graph. So what this basically tells you is that the mutation graph of a given permutation is always connected. Yes. What do you mean by mutation? Oh, mutation I meant by these two operations. Just two operations? This operation over here and this obvious operation. The one that switches the order of non-adjacent guys. Not, not, not uh, the one, the first? The first one is sort of innately contained in the definition of how I define wiring diagrams. To be more precise, 
you need this for something called reduced wiring diagrams, but since I'm only going to be using reduced wiring diagrams, I have introduced you that condition as a definition. So mutations are two operations, one that switches the order of these two or does this thing that comes from the braid relations. And what is known is that given two wiring diagrams of the same permutation, you can mutate one to another. So I asked the following question. Can you say something better? Like, you could ask a bunch of questions, right? Given two wiring diagrams, is there some unique path between them? A unique sequence of mutations between them? So the question basically I asked was, if you have two wiring diagrams that have some parts in common, which I'll describe in a more formalized manner pretty soon, if you have two wiring diagrams that have some parts in common, can you mutate one to another while preserving the common parts? That seems like a reasonable question, right? If you have two wiring diagrams of the same permutation, but they are different. Now, if they have some common parts, then can you mutate one to another while preserving that? So that was my question. And to express that question formally, I have to go through something called chamber sets, which has amazing connection with algebra. Wow, this is like the fanciest <laughs> eraser I've ever seen. So by preserving, uh, you don't want to touch all these lines coming through this permutation. Like, what, what do you mean by it? So I haven't formally defined it yet, which I'm going to do now. All right. So what are chamber sets? So before I define chamber sets, let me just write them down. And it's going to be not too hard to see what it is. So given this wire that ends at 1, what I'm going to do is put 1 on all chambers that lie above this wire. So I have 1 over here. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So a chamber is what? Chamber is a face of this wiring diagram. So if I do this for all other wires, this is a wire, this is a wire that ends at two. So if I do it over here, I get two, 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 and two. And then I do that for the wire that ends at three. So one, two, three, two, three, two, three. Oh wait, I messed up. This is not one to three. Because three goes like this. Three over here, three over here, and three over here. So everything above? Yes, every chamber. It doesn't have to be adjacent. As long as it's above the wire, you label it with the index that you end up with. And now you did do this for a wire that ends at four. So the three, four, one, two, four, one, four, three, four, three, four, four, two, three, four. <coughs> so this is the definition of chamber sets. Given a wire that ends at I, and for all chambers that lie above the wire, you place I. Then you can notice some patterns here, right? This chamber lying on the bottom should always be the empty set because it's below all wires. And this chamber on the top should always be one, two, three, four because it's above all wires. And you can sort of divide the wiring diagram into multiple levels. And the chambers on the same level have same cardinality. And this is called chamber set. The chamber sets were first 
used by Berenstein and Fomin and Zalavinsky. Now, there is a lot of combinatorics and a lot of algebra on the application of these chamber sets, but I'll try to make it really brief, maybe too brief. So this is what happens. Imagine an n by n matrix that is invertible. Imagine an n by n matrix that's invertible. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to be looking at something called principal minors. So what is a principal minor? given an n by n matrix, you take, so given a set i, you take the corresponding rows corresponding to i. For example, if i has cardinality 3, I might be taking the corresponding rows. And then I look at the minor that is obtained by looking at this. Then that gives you a 3 by 3 matrix and you study the determinant of that submatrix and that is called a principal minor. So these chamber sets encode something called a principal minor and why is the principal minor interesting? Well, one of the easiest application is something in the theory of total positivity. So people studied n by n invertible matrices. I don't understand that picture. I have an n by n matrix. And oh, so. Three rows, and then what are those x's? I'm taking the entries. I oh, sorry, sorry. No, you, it doesn't really make sense, right? Or you thinking of uh, determinant? I, I was thinking that principal minor is like determinant of right. principal sub Principal sub matrix. You're right. So. What so I what do is, the first three columns? yeah, I take the first three columns and the rows that are indexed by the set i, and that gives you a principal sub matrix, and taking the determinant over there gives you the principal minor. The so first three columns, which are that one? No, you just take the first three columns. So oh. you take the first k columns, where k is the cardinality of your set i. So for example, if I have a set that is like 2, 5, 7, then I'm taking the second row, fifth row, and seventh row, and taking the first, second, third columns to get so a submatrix. So the remaining n minus k columns do? Why is this an n by n matrix? We have a bunch of principal minors. And each of the different sets index these principal minors. So what I'm going to show now is that given an n by n invertible matrix, you can basically check if all the minors are positive or not by just checking these principal minors. So that is a very well-known theorem in total positivity. I don't understand what the principal minor is. The first three rows, then you take the determinant. The number of columns equals the size of i. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, you can the rest of the matrix with any entries. But what if the rest of the matrix, the two last columns are two zero rows? Then that matrix will have a determinant. I'm assuming this is an invertible matrix. Okay. So given an invertible matrix, you can actually parametrize that using networks coming from those wiring diagrams. And basically there's a theorem that if you look at the if you determine the values for the principal minors coming from those chamber sets, it actually determines the matrix. So that there, I'm just, I'm just uh, introducing this to show you that chamber sets isn't something I developed. It's, it was already there, and there's a very nice theory behind that where it's used in various places. So what I'm confused a little bit is that when people say principal minor, uh, indexed by i, mm -hmm. thinking like for instance, two, five, seven, then you usually take a second, fifth, seventh row mm -hmm. and second, fifth, yeah, this is what I seventh column. You're only taking the first three columns all the time. 
So if you if you multiply the last row by minus one, it will change the sign yeah. of some minors, but it will leave the matrix. But that variable. first, yeah, the first thing you're leaving a vertical, but the first thing you're looking at, what you call principal minors, they don't change because you're you're changing a row that yeah. isn't so appearing in what you're talking about. By minus one. Well, the old complaints that we have. The thing is, <laughs> if you take <laughs> all the principal minors over here, you're basically also taking the determinant of the matrix. So what I'm saying is that you have to take all the minors over here to determine the matrix. You can't change, if you change a few entries or maybe just a few columns, eventually one of them are going to change. So maybe we didn't understand, we haven't seen the relationship between this uh, full set and that matrix, so maybe that's why we don't uh, Right, I mean, it's something that you really have to spend a lot of time to explain the parametrization. It's, it, there was actually a course on total positivity at UIUC for, <coughs> for one semester. So I, <laughs> I guess I, was, I didn't do a good job explaining this, but please understand this does require a lot of okay. background to actually explain it. It uses the Lindstrom lemma and a lot of cool stuff regarding parametrizations and networks. And well, these principal minors are also used to study the parametrize the Schubert cells inside the Grassmannian. And they were also used for studying something related to quantum minors and canonical bases. <coughs> so we have these chamber sets. Then you can sort of guess what, how I'm going to formalize that question. Given two wiring diagrams, can you mutate one to another while freezing the chamber sets that they have in common? So what I mean is, given a wiring diagram and another wiring diagram, can you find a sequence of wiring diagrams such that all of them contain the chamber sets that are both contained in D1 and D2? question now becomes, can you mutate one to another while preserving the common chambers? Now, I will explain why this is not a trivial problem. So why is this not a non-trivial problem? Because these types of problems are trivial if you can use induction. And why you can't use induction easily is because there could be two wiring diagrams that have something in common in the middle of the wiring <coughs> diagram, but have sets that are completely different that are surrounding them. then how do you know that you can trans, I know that I can find a series of mutations leading this guy to this guy, but there's no guarantee that I can do that while fixing this set in the middle. Because if you apply mutations over here, then it's possible that stuff here might change too. And another reason this question was pretty hard is because let's say you have two wiring diagrams and you know their common chamber sets. Given that set, how can you construct other wiring diagrams that contain the chamber? That's also a non-obvious question. Like for example, given this set 1,4, how am I going to construct all wiring diagrams that contain 1,4? That was a non-obvious problem. But there is a very nice theorem by Berenstein and Zelovinsky that solved this issue and completely characterizes what these collection of chamber sets are. So let me introduce you this theorem, which is really cool. So Berenstein and Zelovinsky proved the following. I'll call the collection of these chamber sets a chamber collection. There is a bijection 
between chamber collections and something called maximal strongly separated collections. The chamber collection is given a wiring diagram of a permutation. I collect all the chamber sets. That gives me a collection which I call the chamber collection of that wiring diagram. So it's a set of chamber it's sets. It's the set of chamber sets. Of all, all wiring Of a given wiring diagram. So each wiring diagram gives a chamber collection. So it's the same as a chamber set? Or? Uh, Oh, I think so. Each of them are called chamber sets. Like three, four here is a chamber set. So I, I, when I see this, I see some kind of post set here, right? Because when I go up, I'm increasing. Right. right? It does so give you some post set. set. Right. This post chamber. set is the chamber collection. But I am not really going to use the ordering structure that is given by this rank post set. That's why I just call this a collection. But if you want, feel, please feel free to call this the chamber post set. And another reason I don't call it the chamber post-it is because chamber post-it basically contains the information of the ordering. And if you have the information of the ordering, that's exactly the same as writing down the wiring diagram. So wiring diagrams are equivalent to chamber post-it. But what I'm doing over here is I'm going to lose the information of all the orderings and their placements. So I'm just going to write down a collection of these sets. So I'm going to write down a, I actually, writing down the collection does give you the post set. I, so yeah, yeah, please feel free to rename this the chamber post set. But knowing the chamber post set does not give you the wiring diagram because you have to determine the suitable order of these guys on the same rank. So yeah, this chamber post set over here. So what is this maximal strongly separated collection? First of all, here maximal means not cardinality-wise largest, but inclusion-wise maximal. And this strong separation is a pairwise condition. Given two sets, there's a criterion for these two sets being strongly separated. So basically what this means is you want to create the biggest collection you get by adding some arbitrary sets and maintaining these pairwise condition. So you start with some sets, start adding arbitrary sets without breaking this pairwise condition, and that gives you this maximal strongly separated collection. Now, what is this strong separation? It's pretty easy. Given two sets i and j, we say that they are strongly separated if the following condition holds. You compare i minus j and j minus i and see if they are completely separated on a line. So for example, if I have 1, 2, and 3, 4, Then I'm comparing the set 1, 2 with 3, 4. And I can divide the line completely to separate 1, 2, and 3, 4. So these two are strongly separated. But if I look at something like 1, 4, and 2, I can't really divide the line so that these two sets are completely separated. right? Because 2 is contained between 1 and 4. And there's no way I can cut the line so that these two sets are completely separated. So that is strong separation. What is the strong? I guess I should, oh, sorry, this is Leclerc and Zolomisky. I guess I should ask uh, Zolomisky. Oh wait, he's dead. So I guess I should ask Leclerc. Sorry about that. But there is actually another notion called weak separation. And weak separation is on a circle. This is on a line. Maybe lines are stronger than circles. I don't know. <laughs> so in, in, some, in other words, J minus I doesn't contain an element 
which is in between two elements of i minus j and vice versa. Right, right. So an element of this set should not be contained between these elements here. And elements here should not be contained between things over here. And still, I, like, this collection is still chamber collection. No, no, no. So what do I mean by collection? I and J are subsets of a finite linearly ordered set. I and J, yes. And I just look on them online and see if they're separately ordered. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, the reason I use the word collection is because we have sets and sets of sets going on right now. So for sets of sets, I'm going to use the word collection. So let's take a look over here. Given a chamber post set, this is a maximal strongly separated collection. For example, if I choose 1, 2, and 1, 4, their differences, which is 2 and 4, can be completely separated on a line, right? So the differences should be separated. Yes, their difference should be separated, like i minus j and j minus i. Another example, if I compare 1, 2, 4, and 1, 3, 4, I'm actually comparing 2 and 3. So they can also be separated. And why is this maximal? Let's try to add in another set that is not contained in this collection. For example, 2, 4. 2, 4 is not here, right? So why can't I add 2, 4? is because if I compare that to 1, 3, 4, I'm actually comparing 1, 3, and 2. And 1, 3, and 2 cannot be separated. So therefore, this prevents us from adding the set 2, 4. And it, it's similar for all other sets that do not appear here. So chamber collections gives you a maximal strongly separated collection. And more amazing part, which is the reverse direction, is given an arbitrary maximal strongly separated collection. That is, you start from a set and try adding a bunch of other sets while preserving this pairwise condition is eventually going to give you this wiring diagram. Yes? Strongly separated collection have uh, it doesn't have a order from the left to right, but chamber collection does from the left to right. Chamber collection has no order left to right. So, set plus, uh, uh, I don't really care about their actual placement over here. Really? <laughs> but when you said the strongly separated collection, it will give you a wiring diagram, but of which permutation? So if you just choose maximal strong, so I kind of lied because this is something detailed. So if you choose a um, maximal strongly separated collection, that gives you a chamber collection of a wiring diagram corresponding to the maximal permutation. So the reverse. Right, the, uh, the, the highest in the broad order. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. The maximal length mm. permutation. Yeah, um, is it possible to have uh, two different wiring diagrams that have the same chamber collections? No. No? So chamber collections actually uniquely define a wiring diagram. Uh, no. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I sometimes uh, <laughs> do, yeah, do okay, this. Yeah. yeah. If you co quotient out by this relationship, then it's unique. Uh, okay. Thank you. This bijection is... Yeah, you could also reverse the whole. Yeah. No, no, so look at this uh, reduced word. One, two, one, three, two, one. But you could write down the word. One, two, three, one, two, one. It should give you the same uh, chamber set. So what are you doing over I'm here? No, I'm reading the reduced word. One, mm -hmm. two, one, oh, three, oh. two, one. Yeah, yeah, but uh, just for the one, two, three, one, two, one. maximal length permutation. If yeah, you if I read it in reverse order, right, right. And so I write down that wiring diagram, it will be a reflection okay. about mm -hmm. a vertical axis, and it will give you the same chamber sense. No. Right. Uh, or will it reverse? No, because it depends it on where you're reading this off yeah. from. So, so you know there is going to be a correspondence. Yeah. It's like uh, you have to flip it's the like numbers. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And your calculation is, is determined 
So if you fix a chamfer collection, then it gives a unique wiring diagram up to switching the non-adjacent simple transpositions. Right. So let me show you how to actually construct a wiring diagram given a maximum strongly separated collection. There's a very nice way to do it. So this follows as a corollary from my research with Alex Posnikov and David Spire. And it's pretty cool. So let me, given our maximal strongly separated collection, let me show you how to get a wiring diagram. We use tilings, which is very cute. So what we are given is this collection only. The empty set, set one, set four, one, two, one, four, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, four, one, three, four, and two, three, four. By the way, you, in case you're wondering, if you just place each of these sets in a lexicographic order, that doesn't give you a wiring diagram. So how am I going to construct a wiring diagram using this collection? Well, on a plane, since this is a collection involving ground sets 1 up to 4, I place the origin and place four points on a line. 1, 2, 3, and 4. By the way, how many people know what a Minkowski sum is? OK, well, I can always explain. So we are going to be doing something called the Minkowski sum of points. It's just basically the coordinate-wise sum. So for example, I named this v1, v2, v3, and v4. What is V1 plus V2 going to be? It is going to be a point that is given by the coordinate-wise sum of the points V1 and V2. So in other words, it's just you look at the vector that is obtained by summing the vector O V1 and O V2. So given V1 and V2, V1 plus V2 is somewhere over here. This is V1 plus V2. So any other questions about Minkowski sum? It's just the coordinate-wise sum of the points. Now what I'm going to huh? It's just vectorization. <laughs> yes, it's just vectorization. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's actually better. <laughs> so yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define uh, I'm going to place a vertex for each of these sets just by summing up the elements inside. So for example, the vertex corresponding to 1, 3, 4 is just going to be v1 plus v3 plus v4. So let's see what happens if I place all the points. So we have the empty set over here. And we have 1 and 4. We have 1 and 4, and 1, 2 is somewhere over here, because I'm just adding this vector over here. I have 1, 2, and 1, 4, so 1, 4, 1, 2, 1, 4, and then 3, 4, which is somewhere over here. And then 1, 2, 3, 2, 3 is somewhere over here. And 1, 2, 4, 2 should be here. And 1, 3, 4 is over here. 
and 2, 3, 4 is over here. And then 1, 2, 3, 4. Now what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to construct a bunch of rhombuses. I'm going to tile this with rhombuses that look like the following. I have a set I, I with some small i, i with some small j, then both i and j. So let's try tiling this. I have a rhombus on the bottom, and another rhombus over here, another rhombus over here, here, and here. So you can sort of see that everything gets tiled with rhombi and it sort of fills this uh, polygon which always happens as long as you started out with a maximal strongly separated collection. Now given this tiling, how do you recover the wiring diagram? All you have to do is replace each rhombi with their dual graph then it sort of adds up nicely and gives you the wiring diagram. So, I mean, it's not so obvious if you look at it in this way, but trust me, if you like do some straightening, you recover the wiring diagram. So I'll just take the dual, and you recover the wiring diagram. So using these two tools, I was able to show that, well, given two wiring diagrams of the same permutation, you can mutate one to another by preserving the chamber sets they have in common. So what does this imply? So if you have two wiring diagrams, I mean, this is a really bad way to write math, but I'm basically saying you can mutate one to another while preserving the stuff you have in common. And a fancy way to write down the exact same combinatorial statement goes like the following. So a strongly separated complex every link is a pseudo manifold with a boundary So what I mean over here is, what is a strongly separated complex? Well, it's very simple. You are just looking at a simplicial complex where the vertices are subsets of n. And the facets are maximal strongly separated collections. And what does a link mean? Link, an easy way to describe it is given a simplicial complex, you basically fix a face, and that face sort of induces a smaller simplicial complex, and that is called a link. Then every link is a pseudo manifold with a boundary. A good way to think about this is basically it looks pretty much similar to a sphere or a disk. Now, why did I write this down in the first place? It looks completely irrelevant. Well, strongly separated complex being a pseudo-manifold was actually a conjecture by Vic Rayner's students, Hess and Hirsch. But this result sort of shows that a lot more stronger thing is going on. And 
what Francisco Santos actually told me is that these simplicial complices were studied before. So every link looking like an, a sphere or a disk, these complexes are actually called normal complexes. And it has been shown by numerous people that the dual Hirsch bound actually holds for those uh, normal complex. That is, you get a nice bound for the, the girth of the dual graph. So that also gives you a bound for a path going from a y the length of a path going from a wiring diagram to a wiring diagram, although I'm not really sure if that is optimal at all. So that basically involved a very basic picture of <laughs> what is going on. And what is actually very interesting and has a lot of connections to your algebra is if you do exactly the same thing over here. If you do, you can do everything over here in a more general setting called weak separation. So let me draw a diagram. We had strong separation, which basically was, you look at, it's a pairwise condition where you try to divide on a line. That is strong separation. Now there is this notion called weak separation where you place everything that is one up to n on a circle and say that two are separated if you can separate them on a circle. For example, one four and two three are not strongly separated. But if you look at this circle, oops, much better. If you look at the circle over here, 1, 4, and 2, 3 are weakly separated. Oh, should I need much more space? So, and for strong separation, we saw that maximal strongly separated collections could be represented by something called wiring diagrams. Now, maximal weakly separated collection are represented by something called plavic graphs. They actually generalize wiring diagrams in a connection that's pretty non-obvious. But let me just show you, let me just introduce you what plavic graphs are. So plavic graphs are graphs that look like the following. So here's an example of one of the simplest plavic graphs. It's a planar bicolored graph. And why is this a generalization of a wiring diagram? I won't explain the, the reason, but let me show you a lot of similarities. First of all, we have 1 up to n on the boundary. And this does give you a permutation according to the following driving rule. So you drive along the path. You drive along the edges to get a path. And how do you do that? Well, whenever you have a crossing like this and you come from behind, you come from below, you always turn left. And whenever you have a crossing that has a black vertex, you always turn right. So let's try driving. Do, do colors alternate or? They don't have to alternate. Uh, there are two, all the internal vertices are colored either black or white. But they don't have to alternate. So it's not a graph color. It's not a graph color. Pardon? Boundary vertices, are they colored? Are they vertices? Boundary vertices are not colored. They are, but they are indexed from 1 up to n. Through 
So let me start from 1. If I start from 1, I turn left at a white, and turn right at a black, and then left at a white. I hope that makes sense. So 1 goes to 2. 1 goes to 3. So 1 goes to 3. And 2, if you try it, go right, left, and right goes to 4. And 3 goes to 1, and 4 goes to 2. So they also describe permutations. And actually, they are something called affine permutations. So you can come back to the same place. So oh, yeah. I start at a boundary vertex, and whenever I end at a boundary vertex, I just end there. In this case, if I start at 1, I end up at 3. If I start at 3, I end up at 1. But it's just for this permutation, because 1 ends up at 3, and 3 ends up at 1. But if I look at other affine permutations, then this might not be the case. And there is an analog of the chamber sets. And what you do is basically the following. Given that driving route you have driven, if you end up at 3, you look at left all the faces to your left, and then label that with 3. For example, the route I have taken is like this, which means that I put 3 at these two chambers. So if you repeat this process, I'm going to cheat a little bit. What you end up with is 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1, and 1, 2. And these actually turn out to be certain political coordinates of the Grassmann that satisfy a nice property. So those are Plavik graphs. And what me, Alex, and David actually proved in that paper I had mentioned before was this collect connection that is analogous to this. If you have a maximal weakly separated collection, by going through some similar tiling techniques, you can come up with these Plavik graphs, and it actually turns out to be a bijection. So now let me state the sort of like the secondary main result, which can be actually be described as everything I have done here, this question that I have answered, this is also true for this Plavik graph setting. This is uh, this is a joint work with David Spire. Now, what does this mean? So. The statement itself has, is pretty much similar to what I've stated, but this has some really amazing result. One of the most interesting implications is... No, but you didn't define mutation. Did oh, there, the mutation over here is... It goes like this. I mean, there are a lot of details I'm missing out, but it's basically, given this uh, square, with alternating colors, you can mutate that by alternating the colors, switching the colors. So there are some other minor mutations that correspond to switching these orders, but this is the only mutation that actually changes the chamber set. So what happens is, well, maximal weakly separated collections are in bijection with these Plavik graphs. And given two Plavik graphs of the same affine permutation, you can preserve all the chambers they have in common and then still go from one to another. Now, what is the interesting implication of this statement is the following. So this Plavik graphs, the theory of Plavik graphs has some really, really nice combinatorics. Like for example, there are a lot of objects that sort of represent the structure, possible structures of the boundary and are in bijection with these affine permutations. And well, another thing is 
all the reduced plavix graphs, which correspond to reduced wiring diagrams, have the same number of chambers. So, and there is, of course, a lot of uh, algebra and cluster algebra stuff going on, and even some stuff related to giving a uh, So anyway, there's a lot of stuff going on. And all the stuff that is going on, what our results suggest is that you can actually replicate that for a more difficult setting. For example, to do plavic graphs, you need a fixed boundary. This is just a disk. But what our results suggest is that you can replicate the same theory in a more complicated geometrical setting. For example, if you have a disk with multiple holes, you can still do plavix graph theory over there and the combinatorics still works. Which means that there is some algebra corresponding to those guys, which is potentially, maybe, like if you look at the corresponding cluster algebra, fix some, court, fix some cluster variables, which corresponds to localizing, and Maybe there's some interesting theorems going on over there. Oh shoot, <laughs> kind of over time. Let me just mention one last thing. So, the thing I really want to mention is it's kind of strange that these two happen because Weak separation and strong separation, if you think about it, are two different things, right? Strong separation and weak separation, separation on a line and a circle, doesn't seem like there is a direct connection between them. But somehow what happens is if you take the maximal inclusion-wise collection that obeys that pairwise condition, you end up with the fact that all the collections have the same cardinality, which, is, which I think is very non-obvious. So a good question would be, given some set, given some ground set, and given some pairwise condition, is there some good axiomatic way to check if this property is going to hold? That is, if you take the maximal collection obeying that pairwise condition, is the cardinality going to be the same? Is there some easy way to check that? And I think that might be an easy combinatorics problem to explain, but something that might be very hard to solve, but rega interesting regardless. So you're saying that's an open problem? Yes. So can you find a good axiomatization of pairwise conditions that satisfy this property? So here what we know is that if you define the pairwise condition to be strong separation, this property holds. All the maximal collections have the same cardinality. If you define the pairwise condition to be weak separation, the property also holds. All the collections have the same cardinality. But the reason, it, the reason for each of them are quite different. They require something called tilings. And I mean, it's, it's quite, it's, it goes in a quite different behavior. So what I'm wondering is, well, is there some general way to check if a pairwise condition behaves this nicely? Maybe, I'm pretty sure it would have something to do with planar geometry, but that's just my guess. So thank you for listening.